Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to the first of our breakfast Olympic debriefs, uh, unwrapping and picking through all the action from early in the hours over in Tokyo. My name is Fergus Mainland, and I am delighted to be joined by three fantastic guests for the inaugural breakfast debrief, Martin Goff, Pete Lambert and Melissa Wilson. But before we dive into all the action that we've seen out in Tokyo, we've got a few bits of news to pick through. And the first of those, of course, is that Mo Sabihi will be one of the British flag bearers at the opening ceremony in Tokyo. And Pete, what does this mean for the for the whole team? What an honour this is, first of all, for Mo, but what does this mean? How much inspiration will this give for the whole of the British rowing team? Uh, yeah, I think it's pretty inspirational. Um, I've also seen a whole lot that he'll be the first Muslim flag bearer for Britain, which is amazing as well. Um, I know Mo well. He lives five minutes away from me, and uh, I know for a fact he has literally just thought about every possibility that he can mess up and that's gone through his head three times, and he's giving me like, just don't do that, don't do that, and you'll be fine. And he's definitely going to try one arm it, and he's going to try hold his arm for as long as possible. So I know that's what he's definitely the plan to do. But from an inspiration for the team, it's amazing. I think the last person that did it was Pinsit, from what I remember, uh, amongst the rows. And yeah, like he has been the ambassador for us. He's been the, not the poster boy, but been always pushing the limits for the last for this Olympiad. I think last year, last Olympiad, he was maybe overshadowed a bit by some of the other guys. I think there were two time, three time, Olymp two time Olympians in there, and they they almost overshadowed him. And now he suddenly came into it like everyone sort of almost looked at Mo, and he was so much more of a leader this Olympiad. I think because it wasn't he, it became so much more natural for him. And I think it's a great honour for him and he's really excited. And Mel, it's great to actually see some of the rowers actually able to attend the opening ceremony. So often the rowers will be staying away from the Olympic Village and unable to go. So it's great to have the GB rowing team represented at this year's opening ceremony. Yeah, absolutely. I think that will be uh, something really exciting for the rowers. And I guess we still have to see the impacts that COVID might have on what the ceremony looks like. Um, but it will be really exciting. And I think what's also really nice with Mo is that behind the scenes, he's been the athlete rep for the men in the GB rowing team for years now. And so he's had that leadership role going within the center but maybe not on as Pete said on a global stage and I think that he can do that alongside Hannah Mills who's an amazing sustainability advocate and it's great that now we see each nation having a man and a woman and, and those two athletes bearing the flag I think they'll make a really great team um, and do us all proud. Absolutely and Martin before we move on to the racing that we've had early in the this morning, I think it's worth touching on the spares races that we've had already out in Tokyo. We've had four of our athletes racing and all four of them, uh, Morgan Bolding, Matt Tarrant in the pair, Saskia Budget and Maddie Artlett in the double skull came away with wins in their respective events. That's got to be a good boost for the team, showing the depth that the GB have got before the regatta starts. Yeah, absolutely. I think Saskia and Maddie were in a double and their, their rivals were in pairs. I'm not, not quite sure how that works, um, but you'd be worried if you didn't win that one. Um, but I mean, a word especially for Matt Tarrant, who's, who's I'm not sure there is anybody else who, who has been back to back Olympic spares regatta champion. Um, and the the the. Um, the resilience it must take to, to, to be in that position at successive games really, really takes something. So it's, it's great that he, he gets some time in the spotlight as a, as a little bit of, uh, of recompense for that. So Pete, we've had a year of delay, but this morning we were finally underway at the Olympic regatta and we kicked off with a single skull. So we'll dive straight in with them. And looking across the field, particularly in the, in the men's single skull, we'll start with them. It looked to be pretty much business as usual across all the heats and everyone you would expect seemed to be qualifying in the top spot in, in the opening rounds of the men's single skull. Yeah, I'd say the the winners of all three or of all six heats were pretty much what I would have thought the top six in the A final would be. Um, I think the times were really, it's always quite interesting when there's that many races, how some guys play silly buggers and won't go particularly fast, but 653 opening heat that's pretty swift 
But yeah, no, I think business as usual for the men's single at the moment. I think the biggest thing is going to be later on if the weather gets, if the conditions get a bit bouncy, how is Ziedler going to handle it? Because I think if the conditions are flat, he'll he'll win it. That's my opinion. Martin, is that the, the, the same sort of thoughts that you're having as well? Business as usual or any potential upsets you could be seeing uh, throughout the regatta? You know, it was it was quite interesting to see Ziedler this morning. I mean, he was he, he he struggled a bit at the start. He was he was racing quite high, and he was sort of sitting sitting down in the pack. He's he's fifth fastest to the K of all the of all the heats today. So fifth fastest to the halfway mark. Although, admittedly, of of, of the five fastest, it's it's all within about a second. But he just, he just didn't look he didn't look very happy early on. I know there was a bit of a crosswind there. Um, but from from what I've heard afterwards, people are saying, "Well, it's windy, but the but the water's rowable." So I don't know whether it was just it was just nerves from a young guy. Um, but uh, you know, Borsch looked looked really assured, and I keep thinking Damien Martin. I mean, I, I, w- I was in Rio for five years ago when he he was only a bow ball off off Mahe Drysdale, and I just wonder whether he's going to time it right this week. Yeah, there's plenty of people just wondering whether Damien Martin's going to be able to to go one better than. The Rio will get that gold medal. All he needs to go is a, is a bow ball quicker, and uh, he'll be he'll be over the line. But Mel, turning our attention to the to the women's singles girls, a really great start for Vicky Thornley, winning her heat, and a real confidence pro- uh, booster for her, uh, beating the likes of Janine Gamel in, in in her heat. Yeah, absolutely. I think Vicky put in a pretty commanding performance, and she'd done well against Gamel um, earlier on in the season. Um, and there are. Also, good results across the other heats. Emma Twig did really well. Um, then uh, Lobniggs, Carling Zeman. So I think Vicky's put us, herself in a really good place, doesn't need to go to the rep, can go straight through to the quarterfinal in a couple of days. Um, and it's really great to see her in that sort of position. So certainly the, the single scars, it's going to be one of these events that just gets hotter and hotter as we go through as we go through the rounds, we've got the quarterfinals and the reps coming up next, of course. But what we'll do now is we'll move on to the, the double skulls. And we'll first start with the with the men's double skulls. Obviously, we had Graham Thomas and uh, and Jack and John Collins representing Great Britain. But we had some really, really great racing across the men's double skulls, didn't we, Martin? And two Olympic best times were set in the heats. Yeah, that that French double, Boucheron and, and Andra Diaz, looked looked pretty good in that first heat, set a set a, a new Olympic best, six eleven, and then then the Dutch double, Twilar and Brunink, um, went three seconds better later on. And I know the um, the British double weren't very happy with their start, and they they think they will will step on a bit further. And obviously, they can take confidence from the fact that they were so close to that Dutch double earlier in the season. And Pete, maybe one of the surprises from the from the opening heats of the men's double was seeing Ireland heading to the to the repechage. Look, that heat was tough. Like, like when you when you see that lineup for Cruz, oh, it's going to be tough. And they had, and they all, they just knocked it on the head in the last hundred meters. So yeah, that would be a frustration for them. They'll probably they'll just go through in the in the reps, but the semi-finals. If you look at the amount of crews, they're literally knocking out one crew. So all of what they did in the heat, they're just going to do again in, in the semi-final. They're knocking out one crew. So the semi-final crews, I think, is what's going to be... Uh, the semi-final play, who they're going to be racing is going to be what's really important because I think France, China, they're looking still very strong. The Dutch were looking very strong. If we've got them in semis, that's going to be a rough semi. Yes, it's certainly one to one to keep an eye on. It's going to be, I think, similar to the singles. It's just going to get hotter and hotter, and it's going to be an absolute barnstormer in the semis, let alone the the final. But on the on the women's double skull side, it was a very dominant performance from Romania, Mel, in the in the semi finals, and New Zealand also getting the better in their heat, and Netherlands as well. Yeah, I think the New Zealand double was an interesting one to see because. Liv Lowe had been in that boat with Brooke O'Donoghue, who's still there, and they'd been really commanding through this whole Olympiad. Uh, They were world champions in 2019, um, always pushing right up at the top. But um, Liv is now across in the women's quad, which I know we'll get onto in a second. So it's really interesting to see that Brooke and her new partner are still punching right up at the top, even with that crew change. And Martin, women's double skulls, was there any... Stands out any crews who should be concerned at this point? Did you think? 
No, I mean it was interesting the three see the the three medalist nations from um, from the World Championships what almost two years ago um, are the are the three heat winners today. Although obviously that that change in the um, in the New Zealand crew, the Dutch had a little bit of a scare, um, like really really struggled with their steering off the uh, off off the start there. But it it just sort of showed their class that they they got it back together and and really really patient came back in the last five hundred. While we're so now, while we're talking about the doubles, um, we we should mention Graham Graham Thomas in that men's double. I heard heard an interview with him straight afterwards saying there were there were a few tears behind the sunglasses. Um, you know, having having been in um, in the, the the squad for ten years without making it to the Olympics, I think there was there was real relief when uh, when he he felt today that he could he could finally call himself an Olympian. Yeah, great to see him out in the course, and of course, second in in their heat, uh, behind behind the um, sorry, I've got it all. Oh, yes, behind the Dutch. Um, I'll say that. I'll do that bit again there. Yeah, Graham Thomas, second of course in his heat behind the Dutch. So so Pete, a really good confidence booster, second, but behind the crew who set the Olympic best time. Yeah, as a as I said. It's 13 crews gets narrowed down to 12 for the semi-finals. So it's literally a clean slate after the reps as soon as it happens again. So it doesn't matter. I think they had they didn't have a great start. But if you think about what Graham's had to go through, 10 years in the team, and that's the first time he, now he can call himself an Olympian, that's fine. You had a rough start. It starts again in the, in the, in the semi-final because he'll be, they'll be grabbed for the semi so Mel, we'll turn our attention now to the to the quads, and we'll start with the with the women's quad event. It was Germany and China getting the best in their respective heats. Great Britain heading to the repechage, but of course third behind well, yeah, Germany and the Netherlands. Is this where we would expect the women's quad to be? I think it's roughly in the ballpark based on the Olympiad so far. When we look at the first four crews who are straight through to the semis, you've got China, Poland, Germany, Netherlands, and they've always been the four crews uh, through this Olympiad. I think, though, the British crew has shown real promise this season, and they got that silver medal in the Varese World Cup this year. Um, And I think that the place... Their positioning, even regarding lanes for the rep, is a really, it's, it's a good place for them to be. So they're right between Italy and New Zealand. And whilst New Zealand was a bit off the pace in this heat today, um, given the fact that Live Low, like reigning doubles world champion, is in that boat, I would be looking at them. Um, and given that, so the rep that they do is the first two crews of those full six contenders that go through to the semis so I think that will be quite a fierce race they're in a good position as the fastest qualifying crew uh, but Italy were kind of half a second behind them so it's great that they'll be sat in between Italy and New Zealand um, and hopefully able to kind of command the race from there. And Martin those two race winners China and Germany no surprise really seeing those two dominant nations out in front and uh, and and taking wins in, in the opening heats. Yeah, I mean, out in front, China were four seconds quicker than anybody else and well, well clear of the field. I know they, they, they kept pushing. Um, I think it's really, really interesting. I feel like um, Paul Thompson, who was coaching the GB quad um, in Beijing in 2008, um, that, uh, that got, got beaten by the Chinese, is saying, well, if you can't beat them, join them. And he's, he's, uh, he's coaching that quad now. Um, but that, that, that looked like a, a, a pretty outstanding boat, and it'd be, I'd be keen to see whether anything can beat that later on in the regatta. And Pete, on the on the flip side, looking at the the heats that we had for the the men's quad, you just look down both the respective start lists, and either of those could have been Olympic finals based on all the action and all the chopping and changing we've seen with medalists over the over the course of the Olympiad. Again, Great Britain heading to the repechage there with Netherlands and Poland, and uh, Poland taking taking the top two spots. So so no surprise based on what we've seen this year with with that outstanding Dutch crew. Yeah, I think the Dutch were Dutch winning was what we were expecting. I think the big thing was uh, going up against Australia. New Zealand and Australia haven't done anything this entire season in terms of international racing, so there's always that that you had to look at. Um, I just wanted to also mention that both, all there were three crews that went under 540 in the heats. That's seven seconds off the world record 
but this is such a hot event. You need to be doing 95 to 93% world record to make the A final. And I think this is what everyone needs to realize is that like this GB quad is quick. The rest of the people around there are also very quick. But yeah, the Dutch, I think winning was normal. I think Poland nipping the Italians was impressive. They showed their speed from the world champs the year uh, 2019 when they won the silver. But uh, it looks like the Polish have had a good training seat block now coming up to the Olympics. Yes, Mel, do you think we're going to see Poland continuing this boat speed all the way through? Because we see, we've seen great potential from the Italians early on in the season getting the better of the Dutch. So do you think this was a fluke result from Poland or do you think we're going to see some, some really high quality speed from them later on down the line? I think that's a bit up in the air. It is difficult after a kind of gap of 2020 to have any meaningful way of working out whether this is something that is an upwards trend and, and that people can deliver consistently. I think if um, Pete or I were in the boats at the moment, given the lack of racing and the weirdness of 2020, I think anybody, regardless of how experienced they are, this could be their third Olympics and they'll still feel like they're trying things out given the, the gap so I think it's something to watch and something that we'll not be quite sure about and it'll probably provoke some excitement further down the line. Yeah I'd add to that what, what Mel said is spot on and I think also you you not you cannot take away the fact that this is the Olympic Games and people will either step up or bottle it and you've got all of what Mel just said this is the First time racing internationally, this you haven't done all of this, and it's at the biggest stage of your life. You can either take it and take it by it firmly, or you're just going to drop it. And I think that's going to happen in a lot of the A finals. Crews that are favoured are just going to crumble. I think, Martin, just final a final touch on the quads. It's worth noting. Uh, it was great to see the Lithuanians out racing. Great to see they'd actually been able to, to get over and uh, and get themselves set up with only five days warning. Yeah, t- tough for the Lithuanians. Obviously, a, a bit of a strange situation with that Russian crew where they've where they had some um, some drug tests earlier in the year, and then um, the the governing body suggesting that two of their two of their athletes weren't or the, their substitutes weren't good enough, and pulling the crew out, which I, just doesn't happen at international level. So. Well done to that Lithuanian crew. I mean, I know they didn't have a, a, a great race, but you can hardly blame them at such, such short notice. Um, and the other the other crew I was watching quite closely was the um, was the Norwegian quad because it was great to see Olaf Tufter. Um, I, I think every every Olympics I've been at, I've taken a photo of Olaf thinking it's going to be his last Olympics, and then he comes back four years later and has another go. Forty five years old now, and he made he made his debut in Sydney. Um, so it's great, great to see him still going, but I think he, he may struggle to get past the repechage. So that will wrap up all the, the, all the racing we've seen from day one at the Olympic Regatta in Tokyo. We'll be back tomorrow morning for the second of our breakfast debriefs, and we'll be looking at the reps for the single skulls and the double skulls, and then we start to see the pairs, the lightweight doubles, and the coxless fours making their debut in Tokyo. So my thanks to Martin, Pete, and Mel for joining me for this Olympic debrief and we'll see you all next time.